<clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the first Indiana Forest Woodland Owners Association Winter Webinar presentation for 2024. I am Lee Huss, Owen County Woodland owner and IFWO board member. IFWO is dedicated to assisting Indiana landowners in managing their woodlands for recreation, water, and wildlife conservation, as well as sustainable timber production. Indiana has roughly 3.8 million acres of privately owned woodlands. And just as woodland size, topography, and tree species and diversity may vary, each woodland owner has their own unique goals for managing their property. As, an if, as a member of IFWO, a property owner can learn about management options available to work with forest and natural resources professionals to develop a management plan for their land. In addition to our annual November meeting and quarterly newsletters, we have planned four new webinars this year. In addition to today's webinars this year on birds, we have planned webinars on reptiles and amphibians in Indiana, a webinar on population ecology of the white-tailed deer, and a virtual woodland tour. To learn more about the forest landowners' educational opportunities we have available, or to register for these upcoming webinars, please visit our website at www.ifwo.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce IFWO Executive Director Liz Jackson, who will introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Lee. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. We're excited to have you join us today. Uh, and we're excited to hear from tonight from our speaker. Whitney Yorger is Communications and Outreach Manager with Indiana Audubon. Um, we're going to have our microphones muted at all times. If you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat box and we'll moderate those at the end. Also, if you would turn your video off during the presentation, you're welcome to turn it back on when it's over, but that will limit distractions a bit. Uh, the presentation will be recorded, and I will announce in a few weeks when that's available after we've edited and closed captioned it. Whitney's role at Indiana Audubon is to help connect people to Indiana's birds and conservation through programs and online resources. She's curious, a curious writer and communications professional with a master's degree in nonprofit administration. Her birding story began in 2014 when she spent a long weekend at a hawk watch in Virginia watching migrating hawks with borrowed binoculars. She's passionate about mindful birding practices, acoustic ecology, and learning more about animal behavior. We welcome you tonight, Whitney, and we're really looking forward to your message. So um, your turn. Thank you so much, Liz and Lee. I'm excited to be here. Can everyone hear me okay this evening? Just do a little. Yes, Are we're we good. good, Liz. Okay, great. So I'm here to talk to you all about birding through the seasons and what I have for our subheader of this presentation is celebrating the delights of Indiana's bird life. And that's really my message this evening is to share how exciting that birding can be. And especially in Indiana where you can connect with your sense of place here and um, just really appreciate all the offerings that we have through birds and birds are there the window into how we can explore our state and also experience some of the ecological connections that we so desire and need as we move forward in our history of this state. Indiana Audubon, briefly, I'll just tell you a little bit about the organization. We were founded in 1898. This was seven years before the National Audubon Society was founded. So we are, we are also Indiana's oldest continuously running conservation organization, which is a pretty exciting thing. When I, when I joined Indiana Audubon, I, I feel a sense of pride knowing that we have continually been here in the state helping support the birds. Uh, we have over 1,500 members. Actually, that number is now over 1,600. I should have updated that slide. And we are growing and there is a lot of work that we're doing in the state all across from the northern part to the very southern, southwestern and, and beyond. So we service all of Indiana and we have a lot of opportunities where we can get you engaged with birds. Our mission is to engage communities in the enjoyment of birds in their habitat through conservation, education and research. Um, a, an example here on the left hand side of conservation 
we do work with our partners at the Indiana DNR, and we help with our adopt. We have an adopt a shrike program where we help with uh, habitat for these loggerhead shrikes, which are a state endangered species. And that's an example of some of the conservation work that we do. Through education, we have a whole bunch of field trips. We have our Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. That's also a very educational experience, not just one that is focused on getting as many life birds as you possibly can. There's a lot more that goes into it with programs and events and educational aspects of understanding about our bird life that surround us here in Indiana. Research, we have programs with our Northern Solid Owls. It's an example here, that little cute bird with those glowing yellow eyes. We have a, a banding station that we have been doing research for those that species in particular there for 16 years now, which is rather exciting. And there are also a lot of other projects that we have going on. These are just a few examples. So I wanted to say thank you to the Indiana Forestry and Woodland Owners Association for having me here this evening. You are professional foresters, woodland owners, conservationists. I'm sure there are a lot of other things that you have under this Venn diagram and all these other interesting hobbies. But all in all, we're just really cool humans here talking about birds and our habitats across the state. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so what is, just as we think about birds, birding is a hobby. But what is birding? It is really very simple. It's about the observation of birds. That's it. There's not much to it. It's something that you can do for enjoyment, just like this Roger Tory Peterson quote. And it's something you can do at very little effort or you can do great effort. So there's there's not a whole lot that goes beyond just looking at a bird, appreciating it, observing its behavior, trying to just appreciate it in all aspects of how it looks and where it lives, all the behavioral things that it does. And um, that's birding. It's just, it's pretty simple. Birding itself as a hobby is one of five fastest growing activities in the country. So in, in this is in order of the rate of growth since 1983, which there there's a lot of research, new research that's needed for that, but birding is the number one hobby that is growing, um, followed by hiking, backpacking, snowmobiling, and walking, which is fascinating. I didn't know snowmobiling was <laughs> a growing hobby. There is a study that just came out in November of 2023, and it was the National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation. In that report, there was research done on wildlife watching and they came to this number that 96 million people in the United States who are 16 ages, ages 16 and up, identify themselves as bird watchers. You can use whichever term you'd like. If you'd like to use birder or bird watcher, there, there really isn't a, a difference. Again, birding is the appreciation, the observation of birds. That's all there is. So that number there is pretty incredible. We have 96 million people in the United States. That's one in, did I say one in four? I might, hopefully I should have put that in here. <laughs> um, my math is not great, but overall, more than six out of every $10 spent in 2022 was spent on wildlife related recreation. Now this also includes hunting and fishing. So from wildlife watching itself, birds were one of the greatest focus for wildlife watchers. It's a pretty incredible number right there. The joy of birding, this quote here, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great way to talk about birding as a, just generally what you get from it. Birds will give you a window. If you allow them, they will show you secrets from another world, fresh vision that though it is avian can accompany your home and alter your life. Now that's something I personally connect with as my journey of birding has has grown. Um, I haven't been birding for my entire life. I found it later in life uh, as a lot of other people did. And um, some people have been doing it since they were younger. Some people are just now coming onto it just like me. For example, in 2020, when the pandemic happened, a lot of people started taking up the hobby of bird watching. So we had this birding boom. And you could have seen all these different articles that were coming out about birding from 
people enjoying the respite that they had, looking out the window and just appreciating the birds that were coming through their yard, having not been able to go out and do very much because we were all locked in at home and trying to quarantine and keep our distance safely. And so there are all these stories that were going on, which to me told a very interesting story itself that birding was becoming a rising interest. Now, a couple of years, fast forward to where we are now, we have a whole bunch of groups for who dedicate their time, their energy, all of their efforts to enjoying birds. So there's Indiana Audubon here in our state, but across the nation, we have groups like Feminist Bird Club. We have, Chris, um, we have the Black Birders Week. We also have a group called Birdability, and we have people who are enjoying birds, not with binoculars, but with cameras. Um, people who are doing mindful birding where they don't have binoculars at all. It's merely about experiencing birds in nature and sometimes people just listen to birds without those binoculars. Sometimes they just appreciate the, the few birds that they see at a, at a sit spot. So there's many different types of ways to enjoy this hobby. And there are also a lot of different groups that are out there to make working toward making it more inclusive. In the Hoosier State here, we have a lot of opportunities. I will have to say that Coming from Maryland, that's my home state, I moved here about seven years ago, and I have come to learn and appreciate all of the diversity that Indiana has to offer. It's far different from my home state, and I think that we have a lot to boast. So I'm going to try to go through this evening and talk a little bit about some of those experiences and also what you can expect as you get out and enjoy birds across the state, even in your backyard. One of the biggest things that if you get involved in birding and you start going out and meeting other birders, the, the benefit that you will get from bird watching is community. We have groups of, um, we have, I think over 18, over about 20 field trips that we offer in state as Indiana Audubon, where you can join other Hoosier birders. Maybe they're just learning about birds or they just want to go birding with other people. And so you get the sense of community, you meet people, you find friends, you end up going out birding with them on other opportunities just outside of the field trips. So community is really special as part of birding. And I think for any hobby, it's, it's that sense of belonging that's really important. Also the ecological connection. I tried to think about this and I wanted to bring it up earlier than the, the other, the, the last point that I'm talking about because I really think it's important as part of birder, being a birder and looking at birds and experiencing the natural world and being outside and listening, looking, uh, using all of your senses out in the world and seeing these habitats, you have that sense of place that becomes very deepened. And you can start to see the differences in the habitats and the landscape across Indiana. So that's a really important benefit. And that's something that I would expect that if, as you deepen your interest in birding, you will see more and start to be more connected to this wonderful landscape that we have. Lastly, adventure. A lot of us don't really get into birding thinking that there are these adventurous things or experiences that you have, but I, I can tell you that there is a lot to experience that's adventurous. Just in this picture alone, this is, um, this is in November of a couple of years ago. And this is a lake watching experience and it doesn't look very adventurous, but if you think about the weather in November, it's really, really windy. We have um, very cold temperatures and you get to see all of these interesting birds at different times of year and you start to seek them out and seek out those adventures so that you can have more fun and see more birds and see more la landscape. There's also birds. <laughs> so the birds themselves are why we're here. And we have over 420 species that have been identified, well, found in Indiana, and some of them are regularly occurring. And then others are simply birds that have come along every every now and again, uh, maybe annually, or um, sometimes we get first state records or we have them a couple of times in a year. For instance, this year and in, in the last couple, we've seen a, a huge increase in uh, limpkin sightings, which these are birds that shouldn't be up here in the Midwest at all, and yet they are here. 
this checklist here is the Indiana birding checklist and you can download this on our website so you can see everything that comes through and you can have that and check off the birds so you know what to expect. Now year round we have a, a bunch of different species. Some of them that you you might not think are year round are year round such as the, the um, eastern bluebird. So that that beautiful bluebird with that rusty red on its chest, that eastern bluebird, they actually are here year round, as well as American goldfinches. You can see them on your feeder in the summer. You can also see them on the feeder right now. So we have these gorgeous backyard birds that you'll see throughout annually, well, excuse me, all year round. But we also have these really interesting, no more interesting than the last, <laughs> seasonal visitors. So such as warblers, we have ducks that migrate through that are here just for a few months out of the year. We also have really interesting sparrows, um, thrushes, we have woodpeckers, uh, dark-eyed junco here, that cute little pink bill on, the, on that gray-faced bird. Now these are all birds that you might only see a little bit out of the year and these are the ones that you may get sad as they leave but they're they're going on their life cycle and moving down to where they need to go to breeding or to for feeding. So those, uh, those cycles are very different. And as you start to learn about birds and go birding and seeing what's there year round, then you will um, appreciate them for the short period of time that they're here. Now, we're in Indiana. What I'd like you all to think about is that no matter where you are, whether you're in an ur urban environment here, like in downtown Indianapolis, that's, I'm in Indianapolis, I'm not downtown, but I am in, in within the, the Beltway. There are birds everywhere. They're downtown in urban areas. They're also out in more remote areas like Prophet Sound State Park up in West Lafayette. So the entire state of Indiana is your backyard to explore. It's your playground. You can find birds anywhere in your yard. Um, as you go to the grocery store, you can find them. When you're running your errands, it doesn't matter. You'll have birds, I, I promise. So this is the Indiana Birding Trail. Now, this is an example of a project that we launched a couple of years ago. And the Indiana Birding Trail is a website. So you can go to indianabirdingtrail.com and you can look at the interactive map that we have, excuse me, and see oh, over 60 different sites across the state that have been identified as very interesting, um, important birding areas. So places where birds are migrating to and from annually, like uh, perhaps Jasper Fish and Wildlife Area is one. We also have state parks that are on that uh, and also some community parks as well, ones that are of important bird significance for habitat. So this is a great resource. If you're looking for places to bird or you want to know where birds are being seen, you can always start with indianabirdingtrail.com. Other states have these such as Colorado and Florida. So it's exciting that we have this because it's it's a kind of an ecotourism selling tool, uh, resource to show all of the, showcase all of the habitats and also where you can find the birds across the state. From season to season, like I said earlier, you're going to have a different group of birds coming and going. So here, you are here right now in winter. It may seem like we don't have that many birds and it is true, some of your backyard birds that you usually have a lot more in the summer when they're breeding are not going to be here. But this is the fun part, in my opinion, of the challenge of trying to see as many birds and try to see what is out there in the winter. Instead of staying inside and waiting for them in the spring or the summer, there's a lot to offer in the winter. So for instance, get out there when you're bundled up, um, when the temperatures drop next week, maybe you gotta try and go see what birds you can find on some frozen, some little opening spots in the frozen water and maybe take some trips to some different places across the state to try to see where, where birds might be hanging out. I'm gonna give you some tips on where to look. In the springtime, the, as we go into from March and entering in through, through May, we have some wonderful birds that start moving through coming up from so the Southern parts and um, birds like warblers. We have a lot of different song that you're gonna be hearing. We have all sorts of colorful birds. So. There's really a variety. In the summer, um, it does quiet down a little bit because a lot of the birds are breeding and they're on their territory, the ones that stay here in Indiana and breed. 
then um, the, the migrants have moved through, they've gone up to their northern breeding grounds, boreal forests for warblers and, um, you know, the Arctic for different uh, ducks, for different, um, lots of different birds. <laughs> My mind is trying to get everything out. So, and in the fall, then we have that other transition. Now the fall is different from the spring in the sense that we have a shorter period of time to see some of these migrants that are coming through in the spring because they are rushing to get to their breeding grounds. So they are coming in, they're eating as much as they can, and a new group is constantly moving through. And it's a pretty, we do have a March through May where we have a lot of migration, but it's a lot more condensed and different species will come and go in these smaller windows. So in fall, the nice thing about that is that everyone's had their, their babies, they're, they've already raised their birds, they're moving on, and they are going to take their time on their way south, and they're just going to feed and enjoy their vacation as they move, and they're going to take a lot more time as they are snowbirding down to where they're going to winter. And that's the nice thing about fall, is that you have from um, August through late fall, you have a lot more movement that you can see, um, and you don't have to feel so rushed. You have time to do your laundry, <laughs> for instance. Okay, so in winter, what kind of birds would you think that you could see in the winter, especially right now? One of the things that I recommend for everyone, we have these three different experiences that I'm going to share with you, and then I'll, I'll have a little highlight for something that you could do each season. Here, right now, it's great for you to get out and go look for some of these raptors. We have replica hawks who've come down from Canada, and they are now hanging out in northern Indiana. In Indiana. A lot of them like this open field, so you have to go to places where these birds are likely to be found. If you're going to look for these hawks, um, you may actually run into, since the habitat is very similar, you may run into short-eared owls, and they like that same similar kind of habitat, and they're hunting in, in the evening. So our short-eared owls here are also visitors. They're winter visitors only, just like the rough-legged hawk, and you can there are some different spots across the, the state where you can go and you can see them rising from their day roost and then you can have them hunting just before sunset. And it's pretty incredible if you've ever experienced it. If you haven't, I highly, highly recommend it. There are some pretty incredible experiences where they can go pretty low over your head and they can fly over and they make this cute little bark which is totally not what you would expect an owl to make. The sound is really neat and they're very vocal. So that's one experience. Another thing, we have the Christmas bird count. Now that starts in the middle of um, the middle of December and then it goes until a little bit into January. So if you can get out there and help with this bird count, this is the longest standing citizen science project that has existed in, in, in the nation. And a lot of that data is very important because we're counting birds in their winter time period where we want to know what is around and so that we can update that. Now that's run by the National Audubon Society. However, Indiana Audubon also helps coordinate in some of those ways and helps the compilers and, and get that, that information publicized. So for winter, this one experience I would love to highlight are the snow geese. Snow geese migrate through Indiana. It can vary from year to year how many numbers you will see in the state. However, on average, you can get tens of thousands, tens of thousands. Just looking at this picture, you can get an, a sense of what that is. This is just one tiny spot of this entire habitat that is full of snow geese. They pass through on their migration. And the this all depends from year to year on the weather conditions, perhaps the food availability and the overall population of snow geese. So one of the great places to go for snow geese, I would recommend going to Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area. Now that is in Greene County. It's a fantastic spot to see them in large numbers at this time of year. Just check that out. In spring, I love bird song. So that is my one thing that I really love doing is when I get out in, in springtime, I get my recorder. I like to go out into quieter places and I like to try to find new recordings of different birds so that I can catalog them for myself and also learn more about birds. And um, I recommend just getting outside 
where you live, see what's around, what migrants are coming through in your, in your local patches. Perhaps you have a park that's around the corner where you want to just understand what is changing for those, those few weeks, what birds are coming through in the early part of March or April, and then which ones are then moving through in the May. Go out there, listen, find places where you can see these birds, look at those little buds on the trees and try to see what variety you can get. The highlight for spring that we like to promote is our Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. Now this is, um, we put this on, we host it in Indiana. It's, it's, a, it's hosted and organized by Indiana Audubon. And the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival offers immersive birding experience over four days each year in mid-May. This year we're doing it May 16th to the 19th. So mark your calendars and you can learn more at indunesbirdingfestival.com. We have more than 700 bird enthusiasts who, who come to the dunes to explore and appreciate the rich ecological diversity of that region through guided birding activities and also educational events. So again, we have that birding where we connect you with those birds. We take you on these field trips. We show you where to go. But we're also giving you educational content about them. We're, we're talking to you. with. We have different speakers who come in. We have speakers from um, international speakers, not just from Indiana. We have a wealth of knowledge that's being shared at the Indiana Dunes. In summer, a lot of people might think that summer is a quieter period for birds. And yes, this is generally true. I think that after the, the crazy hubbub for a lot of birders in, in the spring, we maybe don't have enough time to do our laundry. We're always going out at any chance we can get to go and see those birds and try to get as many as we can in that short period of time. Summer is kind of when we relax a little bit, maybe go on a vacation to another state <laughs> and see some more birds that we don't get here. But the thing that I really enjoy is getting out and looking for grassland birds around business parks and agricultural fields. Doesn't sound like a very exciting thing, but we do have some really phenomenal grassland birds here. We have birds like this northern bobwhite. We also have blue grosbeak, um, indigo bunting are beautiful, and all sorts of like thick sisal, gorgeous grassland birds that have their own unique beauty that are actually really important for us to observe because grassland birds are being hit the hardest right now for habitat because they're they're losing their habitat because a lot of their habitat is being turned into these business parks or agriculture so it's one thing to go out and try to find them it's another to try to record them and submit that data so that we can understand where they're going also whippoorwills if any of you have heard the whippoorwill whippoorwill of this bird at night. Um, it's a really phenomenal experience. And also if you go to Morgan Monroe State Forest, you might hear them there if you're there in the evening. Great thing to explore and try to find where these whippoorwills are hanging out. Or um, as the end of the summer comes, looking for shorebirds in August and, and September when they start moving through. A lot of the, the early breeders will come down in, um, to Indiana. And you can start seeking them at mud flats. You can find them in flooded fields, sod farms even. There's a sod farm up in Lebanon that a lot of birds go to looking for some pretty incredible ones, such as the spare sandpiper. And for a summer highlight, I definitely recommend going to Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. Now, Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary is owned and operated by Indiana Audubon. So we have the pleasure of having this property that's over 700 acres and we have eight miles of trails on the property. So you can go there and just hike. You don't have to go and look for birds. You can go there to look for birds and try to experience them on breeding grounds in the prairie and the wetlands and all sorts of the habitat that we have in that wooded area of, of Mary Gray. But there are some fantastic ways to just connect with the birds on the property there, whether you're doing mindful birding or you are going for a certain program that we have. We offer mothing experiences. If you're interested in moths, we do uh, monarch surveys over there. So whatever is happening, we have research on the property that's not just bird related, but also some we are looking at other species and trying to understand what is being attracted to Mary Great Bird Sanctuary. So it's a wonderful serene natural setting. It's outside of downtown Connersville in Fayette County. If you've ever been there, then you will know. And if not, we encourage you to go. And then lastly, in the fall, we have, again, these lovely little tiny warblers 
But the flip side of the fall is that they're going to be in completely different plumage than you saw them in the spring. So they have this change in the plumage and it's a, a great challenge for you to try to learn what what they might look like <laughs> varying from season to season and uh it's 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 very challenging but it's also very rewarding because you can enjoy and you don't get to hear them as much but you do get to see what they look like in the fall and it's i encourage you all to learn about and study the warblers we also have thousands, just like the sand, the, the snow geese, we have thousands of migrating sandhill cranes that are coming to Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, also Muscatatuck, and they are staging there as they are migrating. So we offered, uh, and usually every year we have an annual open house at uh, around like mid-November when we, ha we host, have a station at the Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, and we offer coffee and tea and you can just come and experience the sandhill cranes together and ask us questions and learn about the um just their life cycles and all sorts of facts about them we also invite the indiana crane the national excuse me international crane foundation is also there so um it's a great opportunity if you just want to go and kind of experience the vibe of what all those sandhill cranes sound like together and also just get information and it's just a very nice, again, that's that community aspect of going birding and sharing it with another person, that shared experience. It's really, truly really memorable. And then for something that is um, another educational aspect would be observing our owl banding at the Indiana Dunes or at Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that we've been doing our owl banding for Project Owlnet at the Indiana Dunes for 16 years. In Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, we've been doing that for um, almost almost a decade. So there are two opportunities. If you don't want to go all the way to the northern, northwestern part of the state to go to the dunes to see the banding, you can go down to Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. It's only about an hour and 20 minutes from Indianapolis, maybe a little less. So great place to go and learn about these birds. And um, Mary Gray is a different experience than going up at the dune station. So Mary Gray, we actually do more owl walks, like owl prowls in between when we go to the banding nets and try to see what we have in the nets, if we have anything. And then if we don't, we do all these other activities inside our, our barn and also out on the property. So very different than seeing the, the owl banding outside of the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center. Two different things, but you learn a lot, and I encourage you to do both. So here is our project on that. This is um, from this last season. So we had a photographer come out and um, write an article of, about our project on it banding. Now, this is a project that we are doing in conjunction. It's continental wide. So um, we are contributing data from Indiana from our two stations, uh, along with hundreds of stations across the United States. And they are providing this information so that we can learn more about Northern Sawad owls, their movements, and just generally the understanding more about their life cycles for these elusive birds, because we just don't know that much about them at all. Last season, we banded over 70 Northern Sawad owls at our Indiana Dunes banding station. And that's those numbers will also fluctuate depending on um, how the population of those birds. So really phenomenal. Um, I would say when I first went to see these Northern Sawad Owls before, long before I worked for Indiana Audubon, I teared up when I saw this tiny, cute little Northern Sawad Owl, their yellow eyes, so small. You can see it being held as it's being measured and weighed in that picture. And just eat, you have, you could get, some people get goosebumps, some people cry. I mean, it is just incredible and you can also ask all sorts of questions to the researchers who are there and all of the researchers and the the banding team they are all volunteer based so they are helping us with this work purely from volunteering which is um we had over a thousand hours last year at the indiana dunes banding station in particular so thousand volunteer hours all right so now that we've talked about all these wonderful experiences to get you out of the house this winter also throughout the rest of the year and just experiencing birds in wherever habitats are available, because trust me, their habitat is everywhere, even at the grocery store, like I said, even at CVS. <laughs> the, um, the next thing you might find yourself doing is trying to see more birds. 
So that leveling up aspect, this is not something that everyone will want to do. It depends on what kind of birding you, you enjoy the most, but you might find yourself chasing rarities. For instance, I was telling you about the limpkin. We, that limpkin is that middle bird and we have had huge numbers of limpkins in the state this year and the, the past couple of years to the point where people are, well, I've already seen a limpkin, but it's still very exciting to go and see them regardless. Uh, we also have had some interesting birds like the vermilion flycatcher, a bird that's supposed to be Southwestern, and then purple gallinule, one that you would find in Florida, not here in Indiana. So these sightings are really valuable data though, because it shows what is happening, not necessarily, it doesn't really tell the story of what is happening in terms of climate and and all the factors that go into it, but it does tell us that birds are moving and we we may see more limpkins now than we have in the past. We may see more vermilion flycatchers. We may not. It, it just depends. But that data of all these birders going out is very interesting. So I've mentioned before that it is a wonderful thing to go out and see birds, but also to share where you see your birds. So there is a citizen science project called eBird and it's eBird.org. On the left-hand screen, you can see the, uh, this is a screenshot of Indiana where you can see what that kind of looks like. And it'll list all of the most recent sightings for the year and for other years as well. And also the dates that they're being seen, the timeframes. Um, some people can upload their, their photographs to it and the checklist. So all of this information is going into a research database where bird researchers and others can go and download that and use that as part of their studies. So it's really valuable to share that information. You can also download the eBird app. That screenshot there on the screen is of eBird. And under their explore feature, you can actually use it in real time where you are and try to see what birds you might want to see that are maybe within a five mile radius or a 10 mile radius or 30 mile radius. So there's a lot of really great tools out there that are at your fingertips. You've got eBird. You can have a field guide on your phone Sibley field guide you can download that that's available you just it's like the cost of a, a book the book itself you just download it on your phone and you always have it available and you don't have to have a clunky paperback hanging out in the field bag or a backpack and Merlin bird ID I think a lot of people in the last couple of years especially during the pandemic have excuse me Merlin ID sound ID got very popular in the last two years because that new feature has been created and added to it. But I think a lot of people are learning about Merlin because, because of that sound ID aspect where you can hold the phone up, you can have it identify possible birds that are within the surrounding vicinity that are singing in real time. Pretty incredible tools, right? Oh, hang on. Um, yeah, so overall, eBird, it actually was launched in 2002. So there there is quite a bit of data from 2002 onward. And it was launched by Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society. It's like I said, it's a citizen science platform that allows birders to record and share their bird observations, contributing valuable ornithological research and helping scientists understand bird distribution and abundance. So that is one reason why you should submit your sightings to this resource. eBird, just in some general stats, we have, I, I mentioned with our checklist, we had over 420 bird species that are on the official Indiana bird checklist. Now that checklist is developed and overseen by our Indiana Bird Records Committee. And um, in eBird, there are 422 species and counting that have been logged in the state. That's pretty incredible. And we have over 22.9 thousand birders who are using it, who are using eBird on the regular. Also, these hotspots, just like the Indiana birding trail hotspots are in eBird where you can find them on a map and you can bird anywhere and they're public available hotspots. So there are over 1700 hotspots in eBird. And like I said, you can also upload your data to eBird and already there are over 3 million media uploads in eBird right now. And again, that's, that's growing exponentially probably as the seconds go by, as people are putting new data up. And if you are considering doing this epic chasing of these rarities, just to see what's going on, we have a new tool called um, the Indiana Birding Server, and it's on Discord. And Discord is this app 
Um, there's a, a slight learning curve with it, but it's a pretty great resource for getting the word out quickly so that you can always know what is being seen where across the state. You can also connect with other birders in your local regional area as we have different chats for those regions and just see what they're seeing and plan to go birding with them as well. So there's a community aspect of it. And there's also um, the, the sharing and uh, that thrill, that adventure seeking within the app. And the, I think the, the biggest leveling up of this whole thing, if you want to get into birding to the extreme, you could do an Indiana big year. You don't have to do an Indiana big year. I've never done one, and I don't believe I'm thinking of one. But uh, one of our Indiana birders from uh, last year who completed a big year, this is Mark Walter. And Mark wrote this wonderful article for us. It's available online. If you go to Indiana Audubon's website and you look for the Cardinal, you can look at it in the most recent issue of the Cardinal. And he gives these 10 tips for if you wanted to go and do a big year. Um, some of those examples are like starting in January, trying to see 100 birds in January, and then chasing some of those rarities throughout the year, having fun. Um, really, it's it's a wonderful read. So you can get a sense of what it's like to do a big year here in Indiana and some of the birds that are around. Again, you don't have to do that. I think the, the biggest takeaway from this presentation is that we want you to go out and find the birds, find what kind of birding works for you and appreciate and enjoy those birds wherever you are, whether you are looking at the Indiana Birding Trail and trying to go across the state, or you are just trying to enjoy birds in your yard Maybe you have a special park that's right nearby that you like to walk at every day, and that's a place that is meaningful for you. Well, maybe you could start logging the birds that you are seeing so that you can contribute data and also get an understanding of that sense of place for the changing seasons and what birds might be around. Your homework after this presentation, as you think about birding, is to pick one of these two books and read them. <laughs> read, read one of these two books. So personal favorite is Of a Feather. It's a very easy, very enjoyable read because there's a lot of humor in it. Um, you would never think that a nonfiction book about the history of American birding, and that's North American birding here in, in our country, um, what that is like and where, where we have come since those 1800s when Indiana Audubon was founded in the 1800s. People were still, people were um, collecting birds by shooting them and then taking them to field museums. And that's how they were seeing and appreciating the birds. But now we have um, a lot of history of conservation and our organization came out of that. So there's a great connection to our conservation history and where we are in Indiana with also what was happening at the time with other people around the country. And so if you read Of a Feather, A Brief History of American Birding, it's a really great read. You can get a lot of wonderful juicy stories in there. There's a little bit of tea. <laughs> and the other aspect is if you just want to get into what it's like for doing a big year, you can read this book called The Big Year. And it was turned into a movie, as you can see here in the slide. 2011 is when it came out. It's a 20th century Fox film. And again, there's a lot of humor in it too, but you'll just get a, a general feel for what it's like to bird to the extreme. <laughs> so. That's my presentation. Thank you all very much for enjoying this evening and talking about birds. We hope that you go visit our website, indianaaudubon.org. Go to our events page, that's slash events, and find something that intrigues you and come birding with us. We would love to have you on our trips and please ask me any questions. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much, Liz and to Lee. Thank you, Whitney. That was very interesting. I appreciate you sharing your passion for birding with us. And you've given us a lot to think about and a lot of opportunities where we could get more involved in birding ourselves. So that's always great. I will follow up with a message with everybody with some of these websites that you've mentioned so we can give them a brief overview of those in, in a follow-up email. Uh, I want to remind you this is recorded and we will post the uh, webinar in about a month online. So, and I will send an email to everyone when that is available. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if you'd like to turn on your your uh, video, we'd be happy to take a look at your fa friendly faces. Um, let's see, Patty had a question. She said, uh, I know birds are more active in the morning and near dusk. Is it worth trying to bird during the day? 
Absolutely. That is a great question. I, a lot of people like to go out in the morning. I would say just de de definitely in the springtime, that is a, that is a great strategy to have is to get up when the sun rises and to be out there for the dawn chorus. And well, that would be before the sun rises and see those birds. Now here in the winter time, we have this unique, I guess, opportunity for birding that you can go out and you can see birds in the daytime. So I, I noticed that my feeders are kind of quiet between 11 and maybe two o'clock. And then uh, around two o'clock, I start seeing more birds on my feeder. So if they're on the feeder. They're also out there at your local park. And I like to recommend that that getting out and seeing birds in their second feeding of the day, which which is essentially what I'm talking about here in the morning and then the afternoon, is a great thing. Um, you can still see a wonderful variety of birds in the afternoon. It just depends on the season. I think right now we have shorter daylight hours, so it's easier to see birds in the afternoon. But in the longer months, I think you would have to move your birding towards the evening so that you could get more more diversity. Great question. Great. Byron said, I've read there is a big project at the DNR called the GGS, Grasslands for Game Birds, Habitat Creation on Private Ground. Do you have any more information on that? I do not have information on that, but that you, you've given me something to research and to look into, and I, I appreciate that. So the Grasslands for Game Birds, I will definitely look into that. Thank you for the suggestion. And we have we shared more. Oops. We've shared that with our members in the past. Um, it's an application process to get funding toward creating better game bird habitat, but I don't have anything current on that. So I, I'd be happy to share more later. Thank you. I guess uh, Julie answered him. There is, there is, but only in certain parts of the state and permission participation requires you to own game bird hunting to allow game bird hunting on your property. Thank you, Julie. Debbie said, thank you. I volunteer at the Goose Pond DNR and Sandhill Cranes are there now. Yes, they are. <laughs> the Sandhill Cranes have that phenomenal bugling and you can hear it from uh, way up when they're in the sky and circling around. So a lot of the times when they're migrating in the fall, you can hear, I can hear them through my walls in, in Indianapolis and I'll often run outside and look up in the sky until I can see the flock coming over. So they're just a sight to behold. I did that around uh, Thanksgiving time. I heard them and heard them and heard them. And I, I looked around the sky for minutes and it took me forever to find them. They are so high. Uh, Gail said, I volunteer at the Lily Nature Center at Celery Bog, Celery Bog Nature Area. That's in West Lafayette. Um, there's great birding there. Come see us. Yes, there is. Celery Bog Na Natural Area is, I believe it's on the Indiana Burning Trail. Um, so it is a phenomenal place to go. Lots of wild, wild waterfowl to see and also um, some, some owls, some screech owls that are there too, which is a great property. Mark said, does it bother great horned owls to walk near their nests? Whoop! it popped on me. Uh, I know they nest earlier than most birds. They do. So they are usually pairing up towards the end of the year. So in December, you, you, may, or, you may have heard a lot more of the great horned owls calling back and forth, trying to find a mate. And then they'll start building, um, kind of finding their territory for nests in January, February. So do, does your question is, does it disturb the birds if you walk the owls if you walk near their nest? And I would say um, it's definitely it's a better practice to give a lot more space to especially to owls just to know what that just to give them their space, especially if they're sitting on nest. Um, you don't want to disturb them and have the the mother fly away or um, just disturb them in any way. So it's a, it's a good practice just to give more space than you might think you need. And if you have a spotting scope. Um, or binoculars. Binoculars are great. Just uh, stand further away and then you can observe them through those optics so that you can have let them know that you're not a threat and then also that they can um, feel a little bit more comfortable. So spotting scopes are a great tool for that. Also cameras do. Duck Hunter said, we have recently had cackling geese on Sylvan Lake in Rome City. Also have had scoter on the lake. That's that's wonderful. We yep, cackling geese do move through here, and that that is an experience I could talk about 
just trying to scope through all of the Canada geese in the hopes of finding a single cackling goose or even a branch, something that's really unusual. And they look very similar, um, but it's it's a really exciting feeling and moment when you do find that cackling goose. And also, yeah, those scoters are phenomenal. Um, they're coming into their breeding plumage right now. So surf scoters, they've got that really big schnoz. And they've got these little black marks on their bills and the white patches on their head. They're really cool birds and ducks because they're sea ducks. You just don't get to see them up close. So those are great birds to have right now. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? It looks like we've hit everything in the chat. I will share some. There have been some follow-up uh, remarks about the grasslands for grain, game birds and songbirds program. And I will share some information in a follow-up email, as well as the um, some of the websites that, that Whitney mentioned. Do we have any other questions? Okay, great. Well, we're about at our time anyway, so um, I think I will thank Whitney again for joining us and sharing her information. And I want to thank all of you for participating. It's been a, a, a very uh, stimulating evening, and I was uh, thrilled to hear all the information. So um, please have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Get out there and go birding and come join us. <laughs>